give me your hand and I'll tell you who you are. In my silent darkness, clearer than the dazzling sunlight is all you would hide from me. More than words your hand speak to me of all you decline to say. Trembling anxiety, quivering rage, true friendship, or a lie. All is revealed in a touch of a hand. Who is a stranger and who is a friend? I can see everything in my silent darkness. Give me a hand and I'll tell you who you are. Age is probably the largest cause of death blindness. Other things like rubella, which is German measles, when the mother contracts um, German measles early on in pregnancy. Other causes can be meningitis, trauma at birth, also accident, injury, but there's also genetic condition. One of them, which is Usher syndrome, which is also a major cause of death blindness. Usher syndrome is what I actually have myself. In type 1 Usher, the child is born profoundly deaf and their sight loss begins with retinitis pigmentosa, probably from about the age of 10 onwards. They also have a balance problem. In type 2, which is what I've got, um, you're born with uh, partial hearing, which can be from moderate to severe loss of hearing. And the RP, retinitis pigmentosa, starts probably in the mid-teens. And the final one, which is Usher type 3, is you're born with almost normal hearing. There is a hearing loss. And the, the loss of sight and hearing goes side by side. They found out when I was about three or four years old that I had loss of hearing. My mother had already suspected that there was something quite wrong because she would put me down on a mat in a room and um, I would just sit there and not do anything. Uh, my speech was very poor. Uh, people couldn't understand what I was saying. So when I was about eight years old, I did have some, some speech therapy, and that did help. Because with the type of hearing loss that you have in Usher, it's high frequency. You can actually hear people talk, but you can't always make sense of what they're actually saying because you can't hear the beginnings and the endings of words. So if you can imagine, that would be the way that I actually spoke. And so my communication was quite poor. One day in particular, I was actually asked to read the Bible lesson in front of assembly. I was only six years old at the time, and I had to get up in front of the whole school and read this Bible lesson, and everybody just laughed. Uh, the children sniggered because obviously I couldn't say my word properly or anything like that. But the worst part was the adults because they they also did nothing to help me. And when I finished the lesson, some children took me, as we were going back into the classroom, took me down a corridor and just beat me up. All these children were running around me, calling me stupid and defo. And, and so what I did was I just ripped off my body-worn aid and smashed it on the concrete. And from that day forward, I said I would never wear a hearing aid again because it made me different. At a relatively young age, I was put onto tranquilizers because they thought I was quite paranoid, that kind of thing. So for about 14 years, 15 years, I was taking tranquilizers um, for no good reason, only that they couldn't find out what was wrong with me. And uh, I became, I had lots of accidents. I became very clumsy and people would shout at me all the time. So I'd become more nervous, more paranoid about why is this happening to me? There must be something terribly, terribly wrong with me. And so it, it'd been a long, long haul to be diagnosed. And um, when I was told, I can only say, I probably reacted uh, with great relief knowing that I was not nutty 
or anything like that because that's what I, I really I really thought that I was going crazy that I had something very serious like a brain tumor and nobody was telling me and um, that's how bad it got after all those years of not knowing so it was a tremendous relief but also a good cry right let's go on and see what we can do now and find out exactly what Usher syndrome is I started moving in such a way that was totally alien to me before I just walked everywhere, strided out. I felt I couldn't go outside anymore and I felt that people were looking at me thinking, you know, what's she doing? Why is she feeling like that? And why is she walking at that kind of pace? I diagnosed with clinical depression. I then began to ask for help and I had a rehabilitation officer. I learned grade one and two braille as well, and this kept my mind occupied. Great. Oh, that's a heavy door. Any door. If maybe I could take your arm yes. and I put yeah. Ellen's harness down and just um, we'll find a table first. Okay. And preferably with my back to the window because if, if there is a window seat yeah, um, a, over there. All right, thank you. Retinitis pigmentosa is a very variable condition, so the lighting condition ha make a great, uh, you know, it affects you greatly. Also. Your, your general health uh, as well. If you're not feeling particularly good one day, then maybe your vision isn't quite a, uh, what, it, what it would be on another day. But what, what I have is, is um, almost like looking through a letterbox, really. If I'm talking to somebody, I can see their lips, but I can't see their eyes. If I look at their eyes, then I can't see their lips. So that's how small my field of vision is. The last couple of years, my eyes have deteriorated in such a way that I'm getting like a central haze. I get lots of um, visual disturbances, bright lights, patterns in front of my eyes and great big halos. It's very, it's very starry, it's very pretty, but it's not very easy either. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, and then come and sit. And big girl. Good girl. Which side would you prefer? Um, are you all right if you sit opposite me? Yes. Because, because then I can see, see your face. As long as you're, you're yep, comfortable. Fine. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it's easier for me to lip read then, and I can see your lips. <laughs> I can still read, I can still access print, but it's much more difficult. Things don't make sense because I can only see a little bit of the word, so I have to keep on reading it and reading it until I've made sense of the sentence. And also, the colour contrast is very important. So if I had a, a nice lemony coloured paper and very bold print, uh, th that helps as well. And not necessarily large print either, because having tunnel vision, um, you know, large print, I can only see, I can see even less really. I might see one or two letters, uh, not a whole word if it was in a different yeah, yeah, size. Yeah, really no make the change, because, you know, it's difficult for me, yeah, you know, no washing up. <laughs> it's difficult for me to come in somewhere like this on my own, so I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank yeah. yeah. I find life much better with Ellen. She makes me feel happy happier because I can stride out in almost the same way that I used to do before before I realized that I had had this sight loss and you know you can't go up to somebody and stroke their cane but you can go up and stroke a guide dog people do come up to me and do talk to me I find that very important because because as a deafblind person you are isolated yeah, it's fine. Straight oh, 
Good girl. Well done. I do wear two hearing aid, but when you go outside, what, it, what happens is it increases the noise level. It doesn't increase the clarity of what a person is saying. So I tend to have either my hearing aid switched off or I carry them. Good girl. Now we go and find Abby. Good girl. Off we go. But if I go into a bank or a building society where there is a loop system or the library where there's a loop system, it's very, very useful to wear them. I do find that I'm very confident about going into Abbey National because it's literally the doors open, they're automated door and I go straight in and, and I walk straight down to the till which is right at the yeah, end. That's a good girl. Come here, Ellen. that's it. Just tell her to go down. Um, have you got a loop system? Yes, on? we have. Thank you. Yes. I'll just switch on. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, that's absolutely okay. brilliant. That's really good. Um, I'd like a check today. The customer um, service is very, very good. They've also taken on board um, sensory um, impairment issues. Cash. Okay. Thank you. One of the problems I do have is that the, the girls sit behind um, perspex protection and there's no contrast where there's a gap to put my book through. Um, you could sign there for thank me, you. Is it possible I could actually use the magnifier yes. so that I can um, see see where to sign? Certainly. Thank you. There you are. I'll pass that through thank for you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. That's much better. Um, Final step. Um, the library is a new building and the first time I went there I was waiting for the door to open because I thought I was in front of the door. Because the building all looked the same, it's all white and glass, I was actually standing to the side so the door, I didn't realise I wasn't standing in front of the automated doors. So, so when I eventually found out the door did open and I did go in and it was quite difficult for me at first because it is white and, and all the sunlight, if it's a very bright day, causes me an enormous amount of problem with the glare. There's a good girl. I think it's round here, round here. Yeah, that's it. The layout is very, very good. And the first thing that you actually see when you come in are the audio books, and um, then there's the large print book. So it's all very, it's all very close to the main entrance. Hmm. Come on, it's named after my mum. I'll have a look at that. Bye bye. Bye. Hop up, up, Ellen. Yeah, you can come and say hello to David one day, can't you? When I go out of a building, it's the reverse of when I go into a building. Everything is bleached out, everything is white. I need to stand and let my eyes adjust for a little while. It won't be long. Get some shopping in Tesco. In we go. That's it. Good girl. Right, off we go. Wait. Good girl to wait. Hop up. Good girl. Well done. That's a good girl. They've moved everything, Ellen, haven't they? That's fine. The ladies are over there. Yeah? Oh, they have. They've moved everything. I don't know. Hello, can I help you? Oh, yes, please. Oh, last time I come up, I think the layout's a bit different. I just yeah. wonder if you could actually take me round and just, just tell me where things are than the ladies, like where the, where the lingerie or the um, underwear is, because uh, will, will that be all right? Yeah, and then I'll be fine. fine to do it on my, my own. Yeah, Thank OK. You. That's our ladies' nightwear section. Just down right. there. Right, yeah, so it's actually along the, yeah. the back of the wall. So you get yeah. the nightwear all along and then you get all your lingerie. That's a good girl. There's a good girl. Find the stairs. This way, Ellen. Find the stairs. Don't do that. Right, good girl. Ready? Pop up.
We seem to be quite far ahead with our services for deafblind people. Um, we have myself, I'm a development officer for deafblind people, uh, three-way funded between social services and the charities Deafblind UK and Sense. We have um, social workers for deafblind people. We have a deafblind planning group. That's a very good forum for getting together. Um, and we also have a deafblind register, which I think is um, quite unique, it would seem, in the country. So we can actually register people. Um, and that helps a lot with development of services. What exactly does your job entail? I go out to visit individuals within their homes, um, assess their needs, basically. I do a specialist assessment to identify the services they're currently accessing um, and the services that I could provide for them. And I can also, at that time, understand where there are gaps where we're not actually providing for people and flag those up to whoever's necessary to try and develop a new service. Yeah. Having a loss of your sight and hearing is very very isolating and life can be very very boring so we try and find volunteers to put with those people to match them up um, to offer them some company uh, once or twice a month to come around a friend basically. We're trying to develop um, clubs basically because it's uh, very difficult for a deafblind person to go to a blind club maybe because of their hearing loss or to a deaf club because of their sight loss. It's hard to fit in. So we've recognised that as a unique disability they need a unique service and that is a deafblind club. So we're developing those. We currently have three in Essex, two in the north of the county and one in the south and we'd like to develop lots more but that entails uh, money and people and resources. Anyway, how did you get on with your hearing aid, uh, Elizabeth? Well, I had a new mould. Uh given yeah but uh, <laughs> i've gone back to the old one again have you yes why is that well it um i didn't have very good sound carol wants me to go back to the uh, <laughs> hearing aid department but we've been there so many times i thought i'd give them a rest <laughs> With DeafBlind Manual, you're communicating directly onto the individual's hand. Um, you're using an alphabet-based system, so every letter of the alphabet has a different sign on the hand, basically, and you spell out every word. Um, many people can then speak back to you, so you talk to them through the hand and they speak back, but with some people they might need to manual back to you. And then also there's Block uh, Manual, which is spelling in capital letters um, on the palm of the hand. So again, oh. that's writing every single letter out onto the hand, which um, is a long process, but for somebody who needs that to be able to communicate effectively, then that's what you need to do. And then, of course, there's British Sign Language um, for people with a more profound hearing loss. Um, if then they also have a visual loss, you can bring your sign language in centrally visual so they can framing. see you. So it's visual, yeah. that's visual frame signing. Oh. Um, hands on British Sign Language, um, you're signing and the person rests their hands very gently over the top of yours and that's a tactile form of sign language if you like. Yeah. Um, and then many variations in between. Maisie. <laughs> it moon. M -O -O -N. Oh, oh yes, like oh. real but different uh, alphabet. Oh yes, and this yes. is made up of all different words. Yes, yes. Like the R L alphabet, the ordinary one, you know. Yes. It was invented by a doctor. How I do yes. Doctor William Moon, mm. in, uh, about a hundred years ago. And uh, it's for people who haven't got the sensitivity in their fingers, like reading dots, you know, braille. Mm. These are letters, if you feel these here, they're not so hard to feel. They're mm. just like ordinary letters, but a little different. I've got a braille display at the front with a standard keyboard on the top and having cleared my screen, which I obviously check by the braille, I then would locate the F and the J on the keyboard to make it easier for 
blind people, there is a marker extra on these two letters. Then start typing the same as you would. So I put in uh, the at the moment, and I'm um, putting in fox, which I nicely did a spelling mistake. How do you know if you make a spelling mistake? Because if you feel along here, you've got braille yeah. coming up. Ah. You're seeing it on the screen. Right. And I'm actually feeling it in braille. So the fox has a brown coat, full stop. What are you hoping to produce on the computer at home then, Kate? I use the comp I'm very dependent on a computer at home. Um, I use one all the time for my general addresses, date, dates, diary, birthdays, you name it. If I had a computer took off me today, I would go absolutely mad. My name is Val Stokes and I am the manager of Rainbow Court. We offer training to people who work with deafblind people. We have tenants here who live here permanently. People come for respite breaks and they come to take part in leisure and activity holidays. Hi. Yes, thank you. And you? I wanted to, to be independent and do my own cooking, etc. I just decided the best thing to do was to get on with it and do as much as I could for myself. One has to be prepared to do housework and cooking, of course. One needs a sighted person sometimes, of course, to attend to such things as printed mail and sometimes to sort out colours like clothes. Can you tell me about the poems you have? Yes, of course. I've only had one little poem published the Christmas before last. That is small things. About the importance of small things. Can you recite it? If I can remember, control your wish to do great deeds. Do not forget the little needs. The kindly acts, the helping hand. Try earnestly to understand and to consider others more than you may have done heretofore. We aim in life at grandiose schemes, then often find they are but dreams. While focused on that distant goal, we fail to see the needy souls close by who may need just a smile to make them feel that life's worthwhile. Happiness lies in little deeds performed to meet each other's needs. Hello. <laughs> Mandy. <laughs> yeah? When this bit out here. Oh, where's he going to get it <laughs> 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 I was uh, born deaf. I 
when I was 22, I became blind. She lives in, Tracy lives in Harlow. And social services there were really bad. She had a, a social worker that never used to visit, only on regular, not on very regular occasions. Um, the social services um, said that um, they want, she wanted to move, move to um, at Panfield near Braintree. And uh, social services in Colchester now are great. They're really good. They give her a lot of support and encouragement. And on, uh, on Wednesdays, Mandy and myself go out. We go to bowling. We have dinner out. She's really, she feels more confident now. There's no problem. Every month, Foley House holds a deaf-blind club, which she thoroughly enjoys coming to. So I'd like to ask how deaf-blindness affects their everyday life and whether they get enough help. I had an interpreter with me at the birth. That was really very fantastic to have an interpreter at the birth. I asked the social worker, how can you help me? How I can learn to look after my baby. How to bring up the baby. It's all for hearing, but there's nothing for deaf. Nothing for someone who's born deaf. There's nothing there. How do I know when my baby's crying? Or hurt? Or has fallen over? Or when it's ready for feeding? Social services contacted DeafBlind UK saying that need full-time family help. Two support workers full-time on a ro rotor basis. Elizabeth knows now I can't see. Elizabeth touches my leg and pulls me. N never does that with my husband, only with me. Same as with his signing. Elizabeth loves signing. When two people are talking, she forgets her toys and just watches us two talking, taking it all in. She learned her first sign at three months. She learned sleep. This is uh, DeafBlind UK and this is their rally that they've been holding. I think this is the third rally that they've actually held where people from all over the country come from who are deafblind and they meet here for a day and it's just like a, one big party. Mardi Gras and uh, so that's a very carnival atmosphere. The best thing is really is the fact that we all come together and no matter which way we communicate we somehow manage to uh, understand each other. Give me your hand and I'll tell you who you are in my silent darkness. Clearer than the dazzling sunlight is all you would hide from me. More than words your hand speak to me of all you decline to say. Trembling anxiety, quivering rage, true friendship or a lie. All is revealed in a touch of a hand.
who is a stranger and who is a friend. I can see everything in my silent darkness. Give me a hand and I'll tell you who you are. <laughs>